Well, uh, good evening. Uh, I'm John Comer, member of the Winter Lecture Series uh, Organizing Committee. Uh, and thank you for tuning in this evening, uh, our third session in this spring's program. Uh, let me again acknowledge our gratitude to Humanities Nebraska for its generous support that allows us to bring the lecture series to you. Many of you will know Bob Hitchcock, our speaker this evening, from his long career at UNL. Bob is currently professor of anthropology at the University of New Mexico. He is also an adjunct professor of geology and anthropology at Michigan State University, and is a core faculty member in the African Studies, Pro uh, in African Studies and uh, the Center for Global Change and Earth Observations at Michigan State. Bob began his academic career in 1983 at UNL and rose through the ranks to full professor of anthropology and served as chair of the department from 1996 to 1999. He was a founding member of what has become human rights and humanitarian affairs at UNL. Trained originally as an archeologist, Bob is a cultural anthropologist and human ecologist who has spent much of his professional career working on issues facing current and former hunter-gatherers uh, and agro-pastoral peoples, particularly in Africa. He has worked in a dozen African countries since 1975, where he provides anthropological expertise in land and resource rights related legal cases and conducts social and environmental impact assessments of agricultural projects projects, refugee resettlement, and cons conservation programs. He regularly serves as a consultant to international agencies and foundations, sharing his expertise in a variety of areas such as land rights, social displacement, adaption to drought, conflict mediation, and development planning. Such agencies include the United Nations Development Program, the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, the U.S. Agency for International Development, the International Work Group for International Affairs, and the Open Society Institute for Southern Africa. Tonight, he will address responsibility to protect, protect drawing on a number of cases in Northeastern, Central, and Southern Africa. We are grateful that Bob is with us this evening to share his knowledge on this important topic as it relates to a part of the world we otherwise hear little about. Bob, welcome to the Winter Lecture Series and the stage is yours. Thank you very much, John. And I'd like to thank the Winter Lecture Series Committee, um, the Unitarian Church and uh, Humanities in Nebraska for sponsoring this discussion. Um, I'm gonna start out, I'll share the screen here if that can be done. What I'd like to talk about this evening is um, the theme of this series, which is the responsibility to protect. And I'll go over some of the challenges and the opportunities in Africa. I think all of you are familiar, at least with the African continent. You can see a number of things uh, in this slide, um, stretching from North Africa and the Mediterranean zone in uh, the very far north and through the Sahara, the Sahel in the, um, around the Tropic of, of Cancer and then through Central Africa, extending down into Southern Africa and the Cape in South Africa. Um, Africa has 54 nation states and uh, this is a bit dated, this slide because Sudan has uh, a, a new nation, South Sudan, which came into being in, in 2011. Um, but I'm gonna, I'll address both Sudan as well as South Sudan and a number of the other countries you see on this slide. So the conflicts that I'm gonna talk about have to do primarily with five countries. Uh, I'll start off with Somalia because of uh, the entrance of the United Nations and uh, US forces in 1991-92. Um, then I'll go on to discuss Sudan, uh, 
and particularly discuss Darfur, which is in the western part of Sudan. Third, I'll discuss the Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, DRC, formerly Zaire. And you'll notice the population size there is quite large, um, not quite as large as Ethiopia, which would be my next topic. Uh, and then I'll conclude with a brief discussion of Namibia. Now, the responsibility to protect uh, has been evolving uh, for several decades, but particularly in the 1990s. And essentially the responsibility to protect is a commitment by various nation states um, of the United Nations to do four things. One, to prevent genocide. Secondly, to uh, prevent war crimes. Third, to pre prevent ethnic cleansing. And finally, to pre uh, prevent crimes against humanity. And it grew out of a discussion actually of both the African Union when it was established in 2000 uh, and the UN Millennium Summit in 2000, 2001. And the uh, responsibility to protect principles have been refined a number of times. Uh, an important uh, time was 2009 and even up into 2021. So there's some, several pillars of the um, responsibility to protect, and it's hard to see this slide, but the first one is the protection responsibilities of the state, which uh, says essentially that each individual state has the responsibility to protect its population from those four factors, genocide, war crimes, ethnic cleansing, ethnic cleansing and crimes against humanity. The second pillar is international assistance and capacity building. And that is where states pledge to assist, assist each other in their protection responsibilities. And the third and most complicated pillar is timely and decisive collective response. And that is if any state is manifestly failing in its protection, protection responsibilities, then states, i.e. the international community, that is other states, should take collective action to protect the population. So the International um, Independent International Commission on Intervention and State Sovereignty, uh, which uh, was established in 2001, outlined about six principles uh, to determine or six criteria to determine when one should go in to another state um, and these are the, the specific principles. First, just cause. Second, um, right intention. Third, last resort. Fourth, purport, pur excuse me, proportional means. Fifth, reasonable prospects. And finally, right authority. And this is a, just a slide of uh, the entrance into Somalia. Um, the United Nations Security Council is really key to all of this. The UN uh, has to uh, give the go ahead for a um, R2P effort in a specific country. So there are a number of actions that uh, R2P requires. The first of these, uh, it requires an endorsement by the UN Security Council. And second, uh, it's the essential responsibility of a state to protect its citizens and the international community can and should intervene uh, to assume this responsibility if the state doesn't or can't fulfill it. And uh, responsibility to protect has become an international norm, uh, an international law. So these are some of the UN agencies. It's not all of them. I think it shows about 15 of the 30 odd agencies of the UN. Uh, obviously the UN uh, Security Council, the UN as a whole is critical to all of these, but then various other agencies play a role. So I'll start off with Somalia, which is uh, an area that in 1990, 91 had serious um, starvation, the uh, various uh, communities were being attacked by um, paramilitary groups. 
And the decision was taken during the Bush administration uh, under George Bush, Bush one, uh, to go into Somalia, which finally was done in 19, late 1991. Um, one of the big issues, of course, and this you'll see throughout all of these slides, is the issue of refugee flows. And the refugee flow out of Somalia in those days, this was in the 80s and early 90s, was, uh, was substantial. So this is the definition, the uh, UN definition of a refugee. It's defined as a person who by reason of a well-founded fear of persecution, for reasons of race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group or political opinion uh, is outside of the country of his or her, her nationality. Um, that's, that definition is really important because many people are not considered refugees unless they've been certified by, uh, by the UN and by uh, the country in which they're, they're attempting to enter. So the U.S. intervention in Somalia was um, pretty problematic in the late 80s and, and early 90s. You saw uh, massive fighting in Somalia, uh, the government overthrown, um, and uh, various uh, efforts on the part of the international community to at least raise uh, flags. And the U.N. and the United States both opted to intervene in Somalia in late 91. And the advantage of that, the uh, intervention brought about an end to the conflicts, at least for a while. Uh, this is a shot of some of the people on the streets of Mogadishu. Uh, and you can see the US and UN intervention had advantages of providing uh, humanitarian relief. A lot of that uh, relief was through the World Food Program, but it was also through uh, direct assistance of uh, the U.S. government. And as you can see in this slide, the uh, uh, bags there say the gifts of the, uh, the people of the United States. And uh, this uh, humanitarian assistance was really critical to helping avert the uh, serious starvation that was occurring in Somalia. Um, and so you see in the background the uh, UN vehicle with the blue helmets. The blue helmets indicate uh, UN forces who were in Somalia. Um, in 1993, in October 1993, there was a very bad firefight between uh, the United States uh, forces that were based there and uh, Somali um, personnel on the streets. And the result of that Black Hawk Down incident, which uh, saw the shooting down of, uh, of two Black Hawk helicopters was uh, the United States decision to pull out of um, Somalia. And that decision was made in 1993. Uh, again. Yeah, it was due to, partly to the, uh, the deaths of, of American soldiers, of, of 43 soldiers. I would also mention that 5,000 Somalis were killed in that action. Um, this is a picture of some of the places that were damaged. Uh, and then the U.S. withdrawal had huge implications, and particularly for the question of, of R2P and, and intervention. Um, the Clinton administration decided not to intervene in Rwanda uh, when the genocide began in April of 1994. Uh, that was a horrific blot on U.S. and, and as well as U.N., uh, history. The result was some 800,000 people, maybe as possibly as many as a million people lost their lives and 4 million refugees left Rwanda for DRC, Tanzania, and Uganda. Um, President Biden is facing some similar issues, some of the concerns about how to deal with uh, intervention and certainly obviously currently in Ukraine. Uh, one of the issues that has been very important is the access to water and uh, the right to water, which is an important right. It was established, surprisingly enough, in a legal case in the central Kalahari of Botswana in 2011, which has implications for 
places like Flint, Michigan, Newark, Newark, New Jersey, Philadelphia, Atlanta, that have had serious problems with lead in the water and other difficulties. So uh, moving to Sudan, you'll see in the west side of uh, the left side of this slide, Darfur, which is um, part of, of uh, Sudan. And then you see South Sudan, which is, uh, as I mentioned, was established in 2011. Um, Darfur was the first acknowledged genocide of the 21st century. It was acknowledged by uh, Colin Powell when he spoke to uh, the U.S. Congress in 2004. Um, and two million pe people were displaced internally, uh, as well as many others going into, uh, particularly in Chad. Um, and this has been ongoing since 2003. Um, the government of Sudan and the, the groups that they work with, John Jaweed, who are uh, Arab, uh, have been mounting uh, raids into uh, Darfur. And the bottom line is that uh, Darfur is primarily Black Africans. In other words, you're seeing a struggle, a uh, very ethnically based struggle between uh, Arab um, Sudanese and uh, Black Africans uh, who consist of a number of different groups, probably 14 different groups, include, including Fur and Masalet and others. So this is a shot of African Union troops in Darfur. They came in uh, in 2003. So this is the first entrance uh, and first example of the use of responsibility to protect in Africa. And it also is important to note that it's in the African uh, Union Charter that they have the right to do this. The responsibility to protect is very much an African and later a UN uh, principle. So you can't read this, but there are a few points I'd like to make. And that is the, about Sudan. And I, I got this slide from Sam Totten, who's uh, in the audience, uh, who's done work in uh, both uh, Sudan as well as in, in Chad. He was the member of the Atrocities Review Commission that was in uh, Chad in uh, 2004. And it was a result of those findings that led Colin Powell to declare Darfur as a genocide. Um, there have been a series of events since then, which I'll go through, but a, co a commission of inquiry into events resulted in rec uh, recommendations to establish peacekeeping operations. Uh, and one of the important aspects of this is the AU was uh, in there, but the uh, government of Sudan wouldn't let uh, the United Nations uh, peacekeepers enter. This is a shot of a, a young um, four girl. It's, uh, the area is uh, agri heavily agricultural. Uh, people are both agri agricultural and pastoral, um, and uh, they basically have a very different background from the, the majority Sudanese. The Janjaweed uh, were mounted camel raiders, sometimes on horses. They would go into villages. They would uh, um, kill as many of the uh, residents of those villages as they could. Uh, and they would burn down the villages. Uh, and often this took place numerous times. They would uh, not just do it, do it once or twice. In some cases, they were doing it as many as a dozen or more times. So this is an example, or this is a shot of the conflict zone and showing the refugee camps. And the refugee camps were not uh, totally protected. Unfortunately, the uh, Janja weed would go into refugee camps as well as into the communities in Sudan, in, in Darfur. Um, so this is an example of what, what was going on and, and in fact, sadly continues in, in Darfur today. So the definition of genocide, I think many of you know what this is. It came in the uh, UN um, discussion of, of genocide 1951. And uh, essentially there are four major criteria, it's killing members of the group or causing serious mental or uh, physical harm to members of a group. 
uh, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life which are calculated to bring about its physical destruction, which means, for example, uh, starvation. Um, imposing members to prevent births within a group or sterilizations, etc., and then forcibly transferring children of the group to other groups. So the UN uh, nations uh, troops are now in Sudan, um, and there are large numbers of internally displaced people. And internally displaced people are a critical uh, part of the the equation when you're talking about. Uh, humanitarian assistance, UN intervention, et cetera. There are many, many uh, internally dis displaced people. And this is just uh, a brief definition. Those people who remain in the country of origin, but who have uh, been displaced from their homes. In other words, they can't uh, get across uh, the borders to become refugees. So they're not recognized as such. Um, but internally displaced people, there are large numbers of these throughout uh, um, Central West and Eastern Africa. And I just have a couple of other things in there. You're seeing other kinds of migrants, conservation uh, refugees are those who are forced out of uh, national parks and uh, game reserves, which is a huge concern, especially in Southern Africa. And then finally, economic migrants, people who are seeking uh, to improve their livelihoods by going to other places. So this is what some of the um, IDP camps look like. And then uh, a lot of this discussion really began um, again in the late 80s, but particularly in the Obama administration beginning in 2008. And then things got a bit complicated under the Trump administration beginning in 2017 uh, because of his uh, of Trump's kind of position, particularly on Africa. He didn't really support many of the initiatives, certainly that Obama had. Uh, and also there were other issues in terms of uh, recognition of, of the UN, for example, cutting the budget of the UN, et cetera. So you can just get a, a sense of some of the um, landscapes. And then aid and development is very important because uh, the US government, the uh, European Union, the UN are all involved in international aid. Um, and uh, some of these come out of, uh, directly out of 1945, the formation of non-government organizations like Oxfam and CARE. Uh, and uh, a bit later, Doctors Without Borders, Medicine Sans Frontieres, uh, which has been operating uh, very effectively, but with some limitations, particularly in Sudan. Um, so briefly going to the Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, the reason that Congo became so important uh, has always been important to the United States uh, and to other countries because of the presence of rare earth, uh, very valuable uh, minerals, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, you can see that uh, the Congo has, a Democratic Republic of Congo has a number of uh, different areas and particularly uh, being close to Rwanda when the, the genocide in Rwanda occurred in July of 1994, between four and five million people flowed into the DRC. Um, and as you can see, the UN did uh, get involved late in, uh, later in the, um, in the actions in the DRC. And one of the big issues uh, there has been coltan, coltan mining. And coltan is a particular kind of, uh, of rare earth which exists in the eastern part of the DRC uh, in the region where the Mbuti pygmies are found. Um, and many uh, countries got involved in the uh, the situation in the DRC, partly because they were concerned about access to rare earth. Uh, the Chinese have very significant um, involvement in this, as well as, as Russia and uh, a dozen African countries. And um, what's happened since this uh, 1994 is that we have 6 million people uh, dead and 12 African countries have gotten involved. So this is 1994 to 2022. 
And the Eastern DRC, sadly, still has the highest rape rate in the world. It's got the highest rate of um, or presence of child soldiers, the greatest social instability in Africa, uh, targeted predation, particularly on indigenous people, the Batwa and others, and the presence of the Lord's Resistance Army under Joseph Kony of Uganda, who currently is hiding uh, apparently in Uganda, is the world's most wanted individual. And the International Criminal Court has uh, issued uh, warrants for his arrest. Um, these are some of the child soldiers, and young men. And then refugees, of which there are many, uh, millions uh, currently in Africa. They're by definition, those people who cross an international border. And others are asylum seekers who are uh, coming into the country, but not accepted yet as a formal refugee. And this is a huge issue, for example, in people attempting to come into the United States uh, from uh, Mexico and further south. Uh, if you're an asylum seeker, you don't have the same rights as a full-blown refugee. Uh, Ethiopia, where the current conflict is occurring. And one of the issues that is very much behind the conflict in Ethiopia has to do with uh, the um, ethnic complexity of the country. It's got over 128 different ethnic groups and some of them are vying for power. Um, currently, the, the uh, government of, of Ethiopia is under the control of um, a, the prime minister who is interestingly enough, uh, a, a Romo, um, is uh, they're struggling uh, very much uh, with uh, the northern Tigrayan uh, region in the far north. Uh, in 2020, in about August, September, Ethiopian soldiers entered Tigray, which was uh, an important part of, of Ethiopia. And uh, uh, this led to massive fighting, um, large numbers of refugees and internally displaced people, starvation, and a whole series of other uh, issues facing the people in uh, Tigray and, and, and broadly in other parts of, of Ethiopia. So the situation of, in Ethiopia is pretty complicated. The UN has not been allowed to enter uh, during the current conflict. Uh, UN humanitarian officials have been required to leave Ethiopia. That occurred in 2021. They took uh, all the UN officials uh, and, and told them to leave. Um, and so the big issue in, uh, for the UN, for the US government and others involved in these discussions and uh, responses to the conflict in Ethiopia is um, the starvation and the failure to allow entry into Tigray. Um, now, starvation has recently been declared part of uh, the responsibility to protect in 2021. So not only do you have the four criteria of genocide, um, ethnic cleansing, et cetera, but also now starvation is a justification for entry. And this is what some of the uh, assistance programs look like. This is not Ethiopia because Ethiopia hasn't allowed these kinds of activities to occur. Um, but they do get uh, humanitarian assistance, some of it directly from NGOs, uh, which have been very active uh, as much as they could within limitations in Ethiopia. This is actually a picture from Dada, Dada Camp, which is the largest refugee camp in Africa, just south of Somalia in Kenya. Um, the number of people being affected, interestingly enough, in uh, Ethiopia includes a whole series of ethnic groups in the Southwest. Uh, this is an Omo woman in the Southwest uh, part of Ethiopia. They also have an issue uh, with the construction and recent uh, filling of the Gebe Free Dam, uh, which uh, is upsetting uh, a number of countries. It's upsetting uh, Kenya because of the restriction of flow of water and it's upsetting Egypt because of the restrictions, potential restrictions of water flow into the, uh, the Nile or into, into Egypt. And so there's uh, a large flashpoint in Southwestern Ethiopia. 
this is a, a mercy boy in southwest um, Ethiopia. And this is the issue now that's facing, in addition to uh, all of the complexities, military and other complexities, climate change is very much affecting this part of Africa and actually indeed the whole continent. So there are a number of uh, ecological issues that come to the fore. And a lot of this is changing the dependence on agriculture and natural resources. Um, so the whole issue of addressing climate change is very much now a part of, of a responsibility to protect. And what you're seeing is various kinds of um, dietary shifts that are occurring in, in many of these countries, partly because uh, much of the commodity provision that was done in the past is no longer being done. Uh, if you look at the amount of, of uh, nutritional assistance given by the UNHCR and uh, the World Food Program in African countries, it's, it's down to a quarter ration of what it used to be. And so there are a whole series of issues that are coming up. And obviously the UN is very concerned about changing these. They're asking for uh, greater funds to go into the United Nations. The UN certainly, I mean, the US is certainly considering that and other countries as well. One point I wanna make here has to do with a lot of the conflicts that result from some of these, these issues. A lot of these are being managed locally and not only through international intervention. There's uh, substantial conflict management activity uh, that you see in places like Rwanda, Somalia, Sudan, et cetera. And finally, the Republic of Namibia. Uh, Namibia was established in 1990, and I might mention that uh, there, uh, it, it actually had achieved a status of uh, uh, UN negotiated um, peace in 1980. However, the United States uh, elected uh, Ronald Reagan, who then uh, stopped all the negotiations in Namibia uh, and in then Southwest Africa. The country didn't gain full independence until 1990. Uh, and there, as a result, another 20,000 people were killed. Uh, so the, the, I would say that people's votes are pretty damn important. Um, the struggle for Namibian independence was uh, partly with, uh, occurred in Angola, uh, and a lot of it was through the South African Defense Force um, and the Southwest Africa Territorial Force, which was um, seeking to limit the liberation efforts of um, the Namibian uh, organizations like the Southwest Africa People's Organization. Uh, this is a picture taken in 1985, um, and uh, this is a San child watching a helicopter uh, land. They had the same issues in, um, in Angola and northern Namibia, in which now the Zambezi region, the Caprivi Strip, of helicopters being shot down by um, various uh, warring uh, members of various factions and uh, that the massive defeat of, of South Africa in uh, battles in Angola was what led South Africa uh, to withdraw all of its forces and to uh, sue for peace essentially in 1990. And these Namibian refugees have been flowing into the country. Much of my work has been with, with Angolan refugees in Namibia, um, in the central part of Namibia um, since 2001. Um, one of the things that the United Nations has done very well in many of these areas is provide water, you know, the key to survival, the foundation of human existence. And this is a Zhengtua child uh, at a water tap. And the uh, UN, when they were operating in uh, Namibia and in all the other countries we're talking about uh, has been very effective at uh, water provision. Um, one of the problems, however, is that the, in some of the ethnic conflict situations or in the wars, uh, the first thing that people go after is uh, water sources, poisoning wells and things like that, which is what happened in Somalia in the 1980s. This is what uh, uh, Namibia looks like now, and this 
happens to be a picture of uh, downtown Windhoek. And um, it's important to see the, some of the lessons of Namibia because they've done a good job of, of addressing um, issues of uh, responsibility to protect. They have it in their uh, constitution. They've been very effective. They provided um, forces, both Botswana and Namibia provided uh, intervention forces for the UN, for the African Union. Uh, it was Botswana forces that went into Somalia after the US withdrew in 1993. So the conclusions are several. The first is that the uh, request, the responsibility to protect, it's not, uh, it's not a perfect duty, it's an imperfect duty, meaning um, trying to figure out uh, how and where to go in is very important. The key issue is setting priorities. And if you think of the 25 plus situation of atrocities that need addressing in the world right now, should Ukraine be the priority? Should Syria? Should Yemen? I mean, we're, we're facing this directly as we speak. Um, an important aim of the R2P doctrine, it's been to overcome the sele this selectivity objection. In other words, uh, some countries uh, select which they're gonna uh, help. Uh, and this has caused uh, a great consternation, uh, particularly in Africa, but it's gonna cause some consternation in Europe as well. Uh, the other thing is, and it's a very positive uh, message, I think, is that we've seen the emergence of, of what uh, various uh, academics have called, have called habits, habits of protection, where the international community has come to routinely respond rather than uh, ignore mass atrocities. There are efforts to, to enter uh, countries and to intervene on behalf of uh, the populations being affected. The other point that's important to make is that um, there's been a, the whole thing that happened in Rwanda, for example, the failure to intervene is very rare nowadays. People are going in, uh, UN and uh, non-government organizations, the US, the EU, NATO, are all going in to try and deal with uh, a mass atrocities. So um, while it's, you know, they're not always effective as they could be, as we see, say, for example, in Darfur. Um, overall, the RT, R2P responses uh, have been very significant in reducing uh, massive starvation and other difficulties in these countries. So the conclusion is, and I'll draw it here, is that the um, states need to set priorities and uh, they have to figure out where they are likely to save the largest number of lives. And that's hugely important. If you think about the Hippocratic Oath and do, do no harm, add to that uh, coming up with strategies that are going to uh, ensure that various harms are minimized. In other words, sometimes intervening militarily could result in firefights that have directly negative effects on local people. So um, the concluding point I want to draw here is that uh, the responsibility to protect uh, and provide humanitarian relief and refuge, which is what's happening, for example, uh, now uh, in a limited way in, in Ethiopia, in Sudan, in Somalia, um, that that kind of uh, humanitarian relief and refuge should be the key focus of uh, R2P. In other words, coming up with these strategies uh, is really necessary in order to save lives and uh, promote the well-being in the countries that uh, are very much affected by these mass atrocities. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions that uh, uh, you all might have. Uh, thank you very much for that very fine overview. That was uh, really quite uh, well done with broad sweep and yet lots of detail. So we thank you for that. I, I, I would like to begin by tying this a little bit to our speaker last week, uh, Joshua Landis from the University of Oklahoma, who in my reading seemed to suggest, well, 
if you're going to have eventually stable nation states, you're going to have to have some ethnic cleansing. In some cases, uh, like Syria, you're going to have to have one group be in control because the rest of the country is so fragmented. And here you have presented in your five cases ample evidence of ethnic conflict, instability, problems exacerbated by climate change. And yet, on the other hand, you also mention something that Professor Landis uh, chose not to go into, and that is there are a lot of people in organizations uh, uh, trying to deal with these problems. Right. They have a lot of instruments. You have UN peacekeeping, you have African Union peacekeeping, you have the genocide treaty, you have refugee law and the UN refugee office, the UNHCR. And you did a very nice job of touching on a lot of these legal and diplomatic instruments to help deal with this broad range of problems. Would you agree that maybe early on in Somalia, maybe in Darfur, maybe in other cases, things could have been worse and at least the involvement of outsiders through the UN or through the African Union or through state foreign policy at least made things a little bit better? Or is that not a no, I, good, I, good I, reading I, I of think the situation? So. I certainly think so. I mean, they're, they're uh, not perfect. For example, Darfur, which is still in, uh, involved in tremendous conflict, but um, the efforts of humanitarian organizations, the international organizations like the UN and others have been very effective, I think, in, in at least reducing the, the level of violence and in providing uh, assistance to uh, the people most affected uh, on the ground. I think that I have a much, uh, I think, more positive view of uh, particularly UN uh, interventions and activities than uh, perhaps uh, Dr. Landis, but uh, he made some very good points about some of the problems, as he said, with in Syria and Yemen, um, where they haven't had those kinds of, of uh, interventions and it's very difficult for the UN to have much of a role, but in many parts of Africa, they have had a role. And I think that's been very beneficial. Some of our viewers would like for you to come in a little bit more on Rwanda and I will set you up with this in a way of speaking, maybe to tell me that I'm uh, completely wrong about this. But uh, reflecting on some of the comments that have been raised by our uh, audience tonight, it was my impression that since the Rwanda genocide of 94 occurred rather shortly after the difficulties in Somalia and Black Hawk Down and the killing of Americans and difficulties for both the US involvement and the UN involvement, that people like Kofi Annan who was then head of UN peacekeeping, and who of course was African, as you know, and Bill Clinton in the White House might have stayed out of Rwanda for, I wouldn't say the best of intentions, but it wasn't simply turning a blind eye. They were afraid that if there were further outside involvement in Rwanda, and it went wrong again, that would be the end of UN peacekeeping. That would be the end of efforts by the so-called international community uh, to deal with these things. Does that help explain the lack of involvement to stop the genocide in Rwanda or not? I think it does. Uh, that's an important uh, factor. I would also say that the speed of the genocide in Rwanda, which took place in three to four months, 
uh, was also a factor. It was just trying to get anybody in as, because uh, UN peacekeepers who were there were killed uh, in during the genocide, just at the outset. And uh, they saw that, um, both the Clinton administration and Kofi Annan himself. And that's one of the reasons I think that Kofi Annan later on became the biggest prom uh, promoter within the UN when he was uh, Secretary General of uh, the responsibility to protect. So I think that uh, while um, Rwanda was a real tragedy and all of these are tragedies, I think it did have some lessons and led to a number of, of decisions within the UN and uh, within the international community to improve their strategies for dealing with uh, um, atrocities like happened in Rwanda. I want to follow that up by uh, paraphrasing another um, comment and question from our viewers. It's pretty clear that with all of the instability around the world, with all of the human rights uh, violations, with all the atrocities, and quite properly, you've chosen to focus on uh, five. Um, where should one focus? It's it's a sort of political choice about Pretty where to so. put your where to put your best efforts, where to put your resources, what gets priority. My my own feeling right now is that Ukraine has sucked all of the air out of international relations and trying to get attention to Ethiopia or trying to get more attention to Darfur, not to mention things that will be discussed next week, like uh, Myanmar. Uh, how does this work? How, how, do, how does one make rational political choices about using refugee law, using the genocide treaty, using uh, the laws of war about war crimes? Does it just kind of happen willy-nilly, or is there any rhyme or reason as to who gets the most attention and who doesn't? Great question. And I would say uh, very much there's a need for prioritization. We certainly see the, the concerns in Ukraine and uh, the refugee flows, one and a half million people having left Ukraine in the past week. Um, and it definitely is having an effect kind of uh, blunting the attention uh, to these other atrocities that are ongoing. Um, I think, however, that uh, the way in which the UN uh, is approaching this uh, is really important with the responsibility to protect. One of the things I would say that's going to come up, obviously, in the uh, Ukraine case is the role of NATO uh, and uh, the question of uh, whether there should be a no-fly zone like was established by NATO, not the UN, uh, without uh, UN involvement in Kosovo in 1999. I personally think that probably that won't happen in uh, um, Ukraine for a whole set of reasons. Uh, although certainly Zelensky's appeal today uh, for um, planes from, coming from Poland, MiGs, uh, is receiving a lot of attention uh, in Congress and uh, certainly the UN is concerned about this. But I would say overall, uh, I think that the UN and uh, all these international institutions really need to think through what the priorities are and how they can balance between the, the demands and needs of Ukraine with uh, all these other cases, I mean, Africa, Syria, Yemen, um, Myanmar, all really do need uh, significant attention. And, and the UN resources are not as great as they uh, should be. I think that's important. Pouring money into more money into the UN, I think, would be a very good option. Uh, one thing we haven't talked about, especially with regard to Africa, is uh, media coverage of these events. If I recall correctly, one of the reasons why the United States under the first President Bush got involved in Somalia was a great deal of media coverage. And, and there was a sense in the media uh, 
and eventually in the Congress that we had a lot of military capability and we we ought to do something about Somalia because Dan Rather and everybody else was, uh, you know, standing on the uh, streets of Mogadishu saying this place is terrible and we ought to do something about it. What about media coverage? What about efforts to mobilize public opinion about Darfur? Isn't this a very important factor? And it also explains why there's so much coverage uh, of Ukraine, because this is in Europe. The US historically has been interested in Europe. Africa historically has been a, a back burner. Doesn't the media, doesn't actually uh, public pressure drive some of the decisions about what gets emphasized and what doesn't? Oh, absolutely. Uh, the media is hugely important. Um, and it's interesting to know or to note that uh, uh, media involvement is getting more restricted. If you look at uh, what Russia has done recently with shutting down Facebook and Twitter and, and other things, that's also been done by the Ethiopian government, not allowing uh, um, either people to go into the area, the conflict areas, trying to arrest uh um, media personnel, um, and uh, I, I think all of these are factors. Unfortunately, the international community, all these countries that are committing atrocities have learned a lot of lessons about the power of media, so they're trying to do everything they can to restrict it. And we see that, uh, I, I would say, particularly now in, in the case of Ethiopia, but also uh, as we see um, in, in cases like Syria. And it's worrisome that there's so much effort to try and restrict uh, media attention. Yes, uh, some of it is getting out, but it's, it's really uh, damn dangerous to do this stuff. And people are being arrested like under that new law in, uh, in Russia, where you get 15 years if you call what's happening in Ukraine a war, or if you say anything against the Russian state about uh, um, what's happening. Uh, I think that media restrictions are going to become more and more uh, a big issue. And the other thing I might add, add has to do with access to media, um, particularly in places like Africa. It's a bit like uh, places even here in New Mexico, where there are places that are off the digital grid that, that can't get access to uh, Wi-Fi. And that's a hugely important problem. It's an important problem for the Navajo. It's an important problem for people in Ukraine. It's really a, a huge issue throughout Africa. You've worked in African affairs, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> for a very long time. And you have, in your talk tonight, certainly given us an impression of the range of difficulties out there what keeps you from giving up? What keeps you and what keeps you and others from saying, you know, R2P is a lot of nice diplomatic language, uh, but it's really a dead letter these days. Why don't you adopt that view? Well, um, I think that some of what's happening in places like Africa and Ukraine and uh, Syria, et cetera, really encourages people like us. <laughs> To, to get involved, to continue to do what you can, even to get over there and actually observe it firsthand and try and get information out. Uh, that's certainly something that some of the people I know that are watching this discussion are planning to do, go to uh, Poland and, and try and, and work with refugees and, and deal with uh, and make uh, uh, more information available about what's happening in the Ukraine situation and who have done that also uh, in Africa. So I, I think it just uh, causes um, us crazy liberals to just double down and, and work hard to try and change things for the better. Africa really needs it, but so right now does uh, Ukraine and many other parts of the world. It's a bit um, daunting to see the number of atrocities that are occurring and how to deal with them. But for, for, for us, it's uh, encouragement to do more, do, uh, do better and, and work hard. Uh, one of our viewers raised a question uh, about priorities. <clears throat> 
uh, backtrack a little bit. If you, if you go back to the origins of R2P, there was an attempt to say, look, we really need to focus on mass atrocity. There are a lot of human rights violations. Uh, women are not treated equally. Um, uh, girls are not allowed to go to school. Uh, there are restrictions on the media. But at the heart of R2P was an effort to impose a certain hierarchy on political choice, right, diplomatic right. choice, and say, look, we've, we've got to stop mass atrocities. As you correctly pointed out early in your talk, genocide, ethnic cleansing, major war crimes, we've got to identify the really most awful things and concentrate on that, even if we continue to work on human rights violations in general, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And yet we see a continuation of a lot of these things. Um, do we pay so much attention to, say, refugees coming out of Ukraine and attacks on civilians inside Ukraine because they're white and because they're European. And we didn't show so much concern about Syrian refugees. And we haven't showed so much concern about those displaced or raped for that matter in uh, DRC, Democratic Republic of Congo. Would it be fair to say that sort of just the politics of a situation determines who gets attention and who doesn't? And that means that it's really not rationally possible to do what R2P tried to do, which was to establish a kind of legal ethical hierarchy. We've got to concentrate on genocide. We've got to concentrate on ethnic cleansing, we've got to concentrate on these mass atrocities, but human nature being what it is, other factors intervene. What do you, what do you think about that kind of uh, view of the situation? Well, it's certainly uh, an important view of the situation. I would say that if you listen to African leaders and, and, uh, uh, and others, they're, uh, they're concerned about the degree of attention going to uh, to Ukraine, and they understand that some of that may re relate to race. Uh, at the same time, uh, they see the what's happening in Ukraine as the same as what's happening in their own countries, and so they do feel that prioritization should be set. Um, they're worried about uh, much of the situation in Ukraine sucking up a lot of the attention uh, and the resources. Uh, that exists and that hopefully will be made available. Um, but I personally think that trying to uh, lay out all of these different atrocity situations against one another, there really needs to be some very careful and quick thinking about how to set priorities and how to address these. And it should definitely not be rate based on race. Are there situations in Africa where civilians have been targeted like they have been in Ukraine? Are there some African situations where in Tigray, for example, in the north of Ethiopia, either the Eritreans coming in from outside or the Ethiopian government itself has organized quite horrific attacks on civilians in Tigray it's just that we don't have the media coverage that we have. Has oh, exactly. I mean, there has been targeted efforts to attack attack Tigrayans, uh, and uh, many have been killed, and and uh, uh, civilians are not only being displaced, but again, the uh, the inability of uh, to get coverage, media coverage of these situations, is exacerbating the problem. Um, but I do think that certainly the example of Tigre is, is, a, is a good one because uh, exactly what's happening, the, uh, like in, in Ukraine, the targeting of civilians and particularly those involved in, uh, in some of the resistance efforts uh, down the line, I hope that we uh, can get some resolution to the Ukraine situation. 
and as well as as Ethiopia, because both of them really do need uh, uh, much more attention, much more resources, and uh, uh, a lot more effort to try and prevent uh, the destruction of of, uh, of uh, civilians. Yeah, that's it. Is the big problem as Melinda just mentioned, uh, Russia is an outsider to Ukraine and uh, it's very different. And in fact, many of the, the wars in Africa are internal conflicts like Ethiopia, like Sudan, um, uh, like Somalia. Uh, they're internal conflicts. They may be ethnically based, but they're internal conflicts. What we're seeing in Ukraine is a very different situation where an outside power is, is crossing a border and enter, entering into a democratic country. Uh, those of us who've been following the situation in Ukraine have heard that the International Criminal Court, uh, based in The Hague in the Netherlands, is looking into war crimes in Ukraine, meaning Russian attacks on civilians, etc. Would you say that the International Criminal Court has been of any help at all in Africa, say in um, Sudan and Darfur? or perhaps in Democratic Republic of Congo. Uh, I'm sure you know that the International Criminal Court has been quite um, controversial in Africa. What are your views on whether one can use the International Criminal Court to do something about attacks on civilians, et cetera, other war crimes, whether it's uh, Ukraine, Darfur, uh, Democratic Congo, or what? Well, I think the International Criminal Court has played a, a useful and important role. Uh, just for example, in I think it was two years ago, maybe three, that uh, the International Criminal Court is, issued uh, arrest warrants for Bashir, the president and uh, now ex-president of, of uh, Sudan, uh, as well as for uh, guerrilla leaders, They've issued arrest warrants for Joseph Kony of the Lord's Resistance Army. I think this does send a message uh, to uh, African leaders and uh, people responsible for war crimes. Uh, they're trying to do all they can to avoid being uh, taken to The Hague for, um, for uh, trial. And I think that the ICC uh, has, has actually um, played a significant role in, in um, ensuring that some of the people who have been involved in some of these atrocities uh, could be potentially brought to justice. And I think that would be a very important lesson for uh, Vladimir Putin. Can you point to a couple of examples where outside involvement in African civil wars and ethnic violence has actually been pretty effective. One thing that occurs to me is that if you go back to the early 90s in uh, Somalia, in that situation, uh, outside involvement really did help curtail starvation. It didn't eliminate all the problems. It didn't uh, give Somalia effective central government. It didn't control all the militias, but um, US and UN involvement and the workings of the International Red Cross and all of that did um, do something really important about starvation in Somalia. Do you agree with Somalia? And can you cite other examples where outside involvement has had some, even if limited, nevertheless, concrete positive impact? Well, I do agree that Somalia, um, in that sense, was a success. They, they limited... Uh, starvation and they stopped some of the actions of militias. That was very important. Um, there have been other cases uh, with UN intervention in, in stopping some of uh, really serious genocides and atrocities, for example, uh, Sierra Leone um, and uh, uh, some discussion, for example, in Central African Republic. Um, I think that there are cases, usually with smaller countries, not with uh, very large countries uh, where um, UN involvement has had some some positive effects, has has stopped starvation, has has uh, created uh, opportunities for peace in places that otherwise would 
uh, Liberia, for example, would have just continued to be involved in in serious conflict. So, I, yeah, I'm pretty pretty positive about some of those um, interventions, and I think that uh, there are very big differences, say, between large countries, Sudan, for example, and uh, smaller countries like Sierra Leone or Central African Republic, and those the size of uh, of the um, country makes a difference in these discussions. Good. You um, seem to suggest, at least to some of our viewers, that the African Union and a number of African states had a positive orientation toward R2P and efforts on the basis of international action to control some of these situations of violence. Could you Talk a little bit more about the African Union and either its support for some of these international actions. You, you mentioned African Union peacekeeping in Darfur and so forth. And there have been joint African Union UN field operations here and there. Uh, tell us a little bit more about the uh, African Union and whether it's uh, helpful in putting a lid on some of this violence in these different countries. Well, I do think that the African Union, as divided as it is, uh, has, has been effective, and particularly in terms of uh, sending in peacekeepers. Um, at the same time, you know, there's a lot of debate within the African Union about sovereignty, just like China will say that you have no right to infringe on our sovereignty uh, in uh, some of the situations, say, uh, in, in the western part of China. Um, I think that the African Union is somewhat um, divided. And uh, for a long time, for example, uh, Zimbabwe had an important role in uh, the African Union, less so now. Um, and the other issue having to do with the AU and, and to a certain extent the UN is the amount of resources. The African Union is not uh, well healed financially, and the consequence of that is it can't really mount very many operations, effective operations to try and, and avert mass atrocities. And so they make their own prioritizations, and sometimes uh, those may be more uh, involved with Ethiopia. And it's interesting because in the case of Ethiopia, the African Union is based in Addis Ababa, the capital of, of <laughs> Ethiopia. Um, and uh, even getting in there right now is not easy to do, as people at the University of Nebraska and elsewhere know. Trying to go in to, to visit the African Union is not something that's uh, uh, potentially possible at the moment. So I would say the, the AU has been important, and particularly in terms of developing some of the the uh, principles of R2P, um, but in terms of implementation, I think it's been pretty difficult, partly because of financial and, and political constraints. What do you say to the people who are American firsters or isolationists who say, well, look, Africa doesn't matter that much. Uh, we've got to deal with Russia, we've got to deal with China, We've got to deal with uh, Iran and uh, the US can't really be um, spending its resources on Africa. What do you say to that point of view? Well, certainly it's, a, it's an important point of view. It's uh, one that you hear on in certain uh, broadcasts uh, in the United States. And, uh, um, the, and you hear it actually from some Congress people as well. That, why are we worrying about Africa when we've got all these issues in Europe? Um, I think personally that uh, I understand the uh, America first argument, but uh, I think it's, it's not a very human rights oriented argument and that we need really to be concerned about uh, human rights and well being of all people, regardless of their backgrounds, and we shouldn't be making um, arguments that would limit our assistance to uh, places like Africa. Ever since uh, Somalia in the 90s, Black Hawk Down and all of that, which you referred to, there's been a feeling that uh, if the local fighters really get their back up, and we see this in Ukraine as well, if, if 
the locals are really determined to fight, it's difficult for an outsider to control things. Yes. How, does that, how, how does that affect R2P? How does that affect those who might want to get involved and try to make things better, but they're worried about a quagmire, they're worried about a forever war, they're worried about having no exit strategy, so they are reluctant to get involved, like maybe Obama in Syria, where it just looked like a quagmire, and he shied away from it. Well, absolutely, and I think that's a, a huge issue, uh, and it's certainly uh, driving a lot of public opinion, I think, and also um, uh, our leadership uh, getting involved more extensively, say, uh, in Syria. Had we been more involved, we might have done a better job. Things might have been a bit different, say, with ISIS and with um, the survival of uh, the regime uh, in Damascus. But overall, I think the approach of R2P stands as, as uh, very important. Certainly, it's not liked uh, by America Firsters. Uh, and other more conservative people. But uh, generally, I think it's going to stand the test of time. And also, uh, but at the moment, it's really at some risk, I think, of, uh, of being not irrelevant, but certainly not taking priority in terms of, of public discussion. Well, we've uh, thrown a lot of questions at you tonight. We've been mm -hmm. at this uh, for a while now. Uh, I wonder if uh, you want to give us your sort of uh, wrap up, your concluding comments about international efforts uh, to do something about what are often quite uh, vicious civil wars and other internal conflicts in Africa. What's the main point or points you want to leave us with? I think the, the main point uh, that I'd like people to take from this discussion is the importance of responsibility to protect. Um, even though it's a hard thing to do, uh, it is possible to set criteria for um, the use of R2P, and we've seen that in Africa. Um, also, the uh, importance of supporting the United Nations as an institution uh, generally, and also all of those organizations, whether Medicine Sans Frontier or others that are involved in humanitarian assistance at the local level when, it, when international organizations can't get involved uh, or are not allowed to be involved. I think that uh, I'm, I'm very positive about um, a lot of the lessons of R2P, and I feel strongly that uh, um, the future will see a lot more of these kinds of cases, but uh, with more um, provision of assistance, financial and otherwise, to the United Nations, uh, the world is going to be a better place. On behalf of the uh, organizers of the Winter Lecture Series, I want to thank you for this wide-ranging, well-informed discussion. We appreciate your, your time and efforts, and we hope that soon you'll be back in Lincoln in person. Absolutely. Thanks very much, all of you. Appreciate this a lot. Enjoyed this. Thank you, Bob, and thanks to everyone uh, on Zoom. And we continue with the fourth and final presentation next week, Parks Coble, talking about East Asia the Rohingya, the Uyghurs, and uh, other subjects like that. Good night to everyone. Good night. Thank you.